أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعود بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله تعالى في كتاب العزيز أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الله سبحانه وتعالى has allowed us to witness another Jum'ah and the month of Ramadan is at our doorsteps we expect the month of Ramadan to begin within the next week inshallah ta'ala we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to enter into Ramadan with health and strength and iman ameen ya rabbal alameen uh, the month of Ramadan is a month that, as everyone knows, is a month of many different virtues. We have the virtue of the Qur'an, the month of the Qur'an, the month of Dua, the month of Sadaqah, the month of Qiyam. And of course, the greatest virtue of the month of Ramadan is none other than the fasting, the month of Siyam. And this is the most important virtue of this month. And the fasting is, out of all these virtues of the month of Ramadan, is the one that will get you closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other virtues of the month of Ramadan are good. But the closest way that a slave, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get closest to his Lord is by fulfilling and perfecting the obligations. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi, وَمَا تَقَرُّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا مَثْرَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi that my slave does not go get closer to me with anything other than except for those things that I have obligated, uh, obligated on him. Those things that I've made mandatory. And then when we perfect the mandatory, and when we perfect what is due on us, and we make sure it's good, then we follow it up by the nawafil. We follow it up by the supererogatory super acts. Those things that are recommended. As, of, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in the Hadith Qudsi, وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرُّبُ إِلَيْهِ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ That my slave does not draw close, closer to me after that with the nawafil except that I love him. So the first priority in the month of Ramadan, and the Ramadan has to be a month of priorities. And the first priority is making sure the fast is valid. And make sure the fast is the best that it can be. And when we look at the, uh, the act of fasting, as siyam we find that there's no other work, act of worship that can be comparable to the act of siyam. Fasting is a unique act of worship. And if we look at all the other types of acts of worship, all other types of acts of worship are observable. When somebody's praying, you can see them praying. When somebody's reading the Quran, you can see them reading the Quran. Somebody's making hajj, somebody's giving sadaqah. And then the other act of worship, making dua, you can see somebody in the act of worship. Every other act of worship is observable, except for siyam, except for fasting. When you see somebody, you can't tell that person is fasting. You don't know that if they broke their fast a few hours before or not. And so fasting is a secret between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his servant. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singles out fasting above all other acts of worship. As it comes in a Hadith Qudsi also, كُلُّ عَمَلَ ابْنِ آدَمْ لَهُ إِلَّا السِّيَامِ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِيبِي all acts of worship that the son of Adam does is for himself, except for fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّهُ لِي It's for me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says that he is the one who 
has taken on the responsibility of rewarding it. That Allah SWT says, I will reward it however I choose. I am the one who will take on the responsibility of rewarding. And when we hear words like this, that Allah is the one who's going to determine the reward, then the Muslim should feel happy and you should feel uh, confident. Why? Because Allah SWT is Al Karim, He's Al Manan. He's the one who is the most generous. If you hear somebody uh, you know for their generosity and they tell you, that generous person tells you that they're going to give you a reward for something that you did, then you would feel happy as opposed to somebody who's stingy tells you, I'm going to give you a reward. You're not going to feel too confident. But when somebody who's generous tells you that I'm going to reward you for something, then you get happy. Why? Because you know that the generous person is going to give you beyond, go above and beyond what you probably even deserve. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's the one who's going to, choose, who's going to give the reward for the fasting. So fasting is a secret between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his servant. And only Allah who knows who is fasting. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has singled it out above all other acts of worship. What is the secret of fasting? When we fast, what is the secret? The secret of fasting is we are leaving something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. With all other acts of worship, it's about what you do. But with Siyam, it's about what you don't do. It's what you're not doing. It's what you're leaving off. And so the scholars have said that uh, the Siyam is ibadah tarqiyya. It's an ibadah where you're leaving off something. It's not what you're performing, it's what you are leaving off. And we're, what are we leaving off? We're leaving off our food. We're leaving off our drink. We're leaving off our desires. For whose sake? For the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the believer should know that any act of worship, we have two principles that I want to draw everyone's attention to. The first principle is that every act of worship you do, any good thing you do, that you will see a reward for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for it. And it comes many places in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jalla, for example, says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْلَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah does not waste the efforts of those who do good. So this is the first principle. Anything you do and it's good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repay you, even if it's small. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِقَالَ ذَرْوَةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى Even if you do the smallest act, the smaller act of good, Allah, you will see it on the Day of Judgment. So, the first principle is that whatever good you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward for it. Second principle is that whatever you leave off for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with something better. And this comes to us in hadith, in which the Prophet says, إِنَّكَ لَن تَدَعَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِلَّا بَدَّلَكَ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْهُ That Allah, the Prophet says, that you don't leave anything, you will not leave off anything for the sake of Allah, except that Allah will replace it with something that is better. Another hadith of uh, riwayah, من ترك شيئا لله عوده الله خيرا منه That whatever, whoever leaves something off for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with what is better. And so when we look at our fasting, what are we doing? We're leaving something off for the sake of Allah. And so we return back to this principle. These two principles, that whatever good you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward. And whatever you leave off for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you what is better. And this applies to not just fasting, anything in general. Whatever you leave off, whatever, whether it's leaving off something haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what is better, will replace it with something better. You leave off something, maybe there is a, uh, a job you are offered, but this job contains something clearly haram. And you leave it off for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet says, if you leave this off, Allah will replace it with something better. Or you leave off something that's disliked. Maybe it's not to the level of haram, but it's disliked, but you leave it off for the sake of Allah. Or something is doubtful, you don't know if, if it's haram, halal or haram, but you leave it off. That whoever leaves off the doubtful matters, he has protected his religion, he's protected his character. Or you could even leave off something that is permissible for the sake of Allah, or even something that's good, you leave it off for something better. Whatever you leave off for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you and replace it with what is better. Now this reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, it could come in the same form as what you left. You Maybe you left off haram money, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace it with halal pure money. Or you left off a haram relationship, and Allah replace it with a halal relationship. Or it could come in the form of something else. You left off something, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced it in a form that's different than what you left off. Or the last way is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace it with something better in the akhirah. And of course this is the best. And this is what 
carries the most reward. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in numerous places in the Quran, that the life of the what is contained in the hereafter is better than what is in the dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can replace it with something that is better in the hereafter. So these are the three possibilities of when you leave something off for the sake of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it with that which is better. And inshallah ta'ala we give you a few examples of this hadith and how it was, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it to come into reality. We first start with an example of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his surah in the chapter 12 in the Quran and mentions many different incidents that Prophet Yusuf went through. And one of these incidents is that Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam was tempted and seduced by a woman. And Allah Azza wa mentions the story of how this woman, she tempted him, she seduced him, and Prophet Yusuf's response. And when we look at the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, we will see that Prophet Yusuf had every excuse in the world to fall into zina. He had every excuse in the world to fall into fornication. In fact, we could probably say that if anyone in the entire history of the world had an excuse to fall into fornication, it would have been Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Why is that? Because Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, he was a stranger. He was in Egypt, but he was not Egyptian. He was not from that place. He was a stranger. And you know, as a stranger, you don't have to live up to the expectations of the people. Because you're a stranger in a foreign land, you don't have expectations that you have to live up to. So he was a stranger. And on top of that, he was a slave. He was enslaved. So you know, the slave has to obey the order of the master. And who was his master? The master, his master was the minister of, the, of Egypt. And the one seducing him, the one seducing him was the wife of that minister. So all these factors are making, making things very difficult. And on top of that, Yusuf was a young man. He was a youth, he was a young man. And in, in addition to that, in addition to that, the one who was tempting him was a woman known for her beauty. And she was also known for her status. She's the wife of Al-Aziz. She was the wife of the, the minister. So all these factors are playing against Yusuf alayhi salam. And these are the external factors. And then when you look at the, the, what the actual event will happen when Allah Azza wa describes it, Allah Azza wa describes that, the, that she came and she closed the door. She came and she closed the door. And Allah Azza wa uses the verb And there's a principle in Arabic that there's a difference between the word and غلقه. When you have, when you say with tashdeed of the lamb, that it enhances the meaning. There's a principle in Arabic that ziyadat fil ma'na or ziyadat fil mabna, ziyadat fil ma'na. That when you increase the letters of a word in Arabic, the meaning also gets increased. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, what he says, he says, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ That she shut the doors, but she didn't just shut the door, she shut it in a way that no one's going to open it afterwards. And she didn't just shut one door. Allah says, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ she, she shut all the doors so that he couldn't escape. And then after that, what did she do? She grabbed him. She grabbed him and she pulled him from the back. So if anyone had an excuse to fall into fornication, zina, it would have been Yusuf alayhi salam. But what did he do? He left off something that was, attempting, was tempting for him. He left off something that was alluring for him. And he left it off for the sake of Allah azza wa jal. And what did he say? Allah azza wa jal tells us the Quran, قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيْهِ He said, prison is better and more beloved for me than what they are they calling me to. So I'd rather go to prison than fall into this sin. So he left this off for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so Yusuf entered prison. And he came across two fellow prisoners and he interpreted dreams for them. And later on this news came to the king and the king had a dream and the king also needed dream interpretation and the matter became, uh, it came to Yusuf alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam, the story goes that he interpreted the dream, dream of the king until we get to the verse where Allah Azza wa mentions what the king said to Yusuf. That on this day you have earned a very high status. This was the reward that Yusuf alayhi salam gave for giving up, for giving up what was haram. He gave him something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Allah replaced it with this. Whoever gives up something for the sake of Allah, Allah replaces it with what is better. So Yusuf gave up 
giving into the giving into the desires of this woman and giving to his own desires and then what was the reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him have a high position in the kingdom the king gave him a high position as Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُسُفِ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَتَبَوَّعُ مِنْهَا حَيْثُ يَشَاءُ that Allah says that we establish Yusuf on the earth do t- free, free to do whatever he pleases يُسُوبُ بِرَحْمَتِنَا مَنْ نَشَاءُ وَلَا نُدِيعُ أَجْرُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ and Allah Azza wa Jalla says at the end of the verse that we don't waste the rewards of the righteous we don't waste the rewards of the good doers so this was Yusuf alayhi salam who gave up something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla and Allah Azza wa Jalla replaced it with something much better than that the second example also of a prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is Prophet Sulaiman ibn Dawood. Prophet Sulaiman ibn Dawood. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Sulaiman alayhi salam had a very, uh, he had a very extreme love for horses. He had extreme love for horses and fast war horses. If you compare that today, it's like a person has a, a obsession or with with fast, uh, fancy cars, fast fancy cars. So Prophet. Sulaiman had a extreme love for horses, war horses. And Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions an incident that happened where he says, وَهَبْنَا لِدَاوُدَ سُلَيْمَانِ نِعْمَ الْعَبْدُ إِنَّهُ أَوَابُ إِذْ عُرُدَ عَلَيْهِ بِالْعَشِيِّ الصَّافِيَنَاتُ الْجِيَادِ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَحْبَبْتُ حُبَّ الْخَيْرِ عَنْ ذِكْرِ رَبِّي حَتَّى تَوَارَتْ بِالْحِجَابِ That Sulaiman salam, it was presented to him, these war horses, they were presented to him in the afternoon. And he became distracted with it. And he was looking at it and he was observing them and memor- mesmerized by these horses. And then what happened? He missed Salat al Asr. Allah Azza wa Jalla says that, Hatta Tawarud al Hijab, that it's the time for Maghrib came in and he missed Salat al Asr. So Sulaiman alayhi salam realized that this thing here is distracting me and it's causing me to miss my Salat. It's causing me to miss out the worship of my Lord. So what did he do? He gave it up for the sake of Allah. Whoever gives up something for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with something better. So Sulaiman salam, he slaughtered the horses uh, for the sake of Allah. He slaughtered them and he gave them up. What was his reward? What did he get? He gave up something for the sake of Allah. What did he get? Allah mentions later on in the surah, That we subjected the wind to him. Allah subjected the wind. So that he, the wind was at his command. Wherever he chose the wind to go, the wind would flow in his direction that he wanted to. So this was the reward Allah Azza wa Jalla gave for him giving up something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And of course, this is uh, the highest level. We don't expect uh, everyone to have to give up something completely for the sake of Allah. Something is distracting you. But sometimes there is situations where you see that something is distracting you and it's causing you to forget the worship of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Then maybe it's time to give it up. And you give it up for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal and you remember this hadith. That whatever you give up for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with something better. The last example we'll mention is an example of one of the scholars of the past. By the name of Muhammad Bazar al-Ansari. This scholar, he mentions his story. And he says that he was in Mecca. And he was afflicted with poverty. And one day he was extremely hungry. Very hungry nothing to eat and he was just walking around looking for something to eat and he came across a purse and he picked up this purse and he opened it and in this purse contained a pearl necklace contained a pearl necklace very valuable very precious and all these thoughts started, started to come across his mind what am i going to do you know i'm i'm poor i'm hungry if i take this purse or if I take this necklace and I sell it, I can get a lot of money. It will cover me for a very long time. So all these thoughts started to go in his head. And he's fighting with his nafs. His nafs and the shaitan is telling him, take this. You need it. You're in need. Maybe the person who left it, you know, they're not coming back. It's permissible to take something that you find in the street. And as his, these thoughts are going through his head, he hears a call. The man who dropped the purse makes an announcement that he's going to give a, a certain amount of dinars, gold dinars, to anyone who will bring this purse back. So as he hears this, it means he comes to his senses, and he says, I have to return. So he goes to the man, 
and he asks the man, you know, told, he tells him, describe, describe this purse to me. And the man describes it in extreme detail to the, the point where there's no doubt that it, he's the one who left the purse. And the man, so he gives him the purse. He says, here, take it. This is yours. And the man was offering a reward. He was offering a certain amount of dinars, gold coins. And this scholar he refused to take it. He said, this is, I ha this is something I had to give back to you. I don't deserve a reward for this. So he refused to take it. And the man kept on insisting you take it, and he refused to take it. And they parted ways. Later on, the story goes that this scholar, he went on an expedition on a boat. And along the way, the boat, uh, maybe something happened to the boat, it capsized. And everyone drowned. And all the possessions in the boat were uh, thrown overboard. And everyone drowned except for him. He survived by uh, clinging and grasping to a part of the boat. And he was floating in the water for a few days. And he didn't know where, where this water would take him. Until he washed up on an island. So he washed up on this island, and this island, we were, we were believers. It was a Muslim, Muslim island. People were Muslim there. So he washed up on the island, and he went, and they were masajid in this island. And he started to read Quran, go there praying, read the Quran. And the people, they came across him, and he's a stranger, they listened to him. And they noticed that he is skilled in reciting Quran. So they came to him and they said, we're going to give you a payment if you teach us Quran. And so he began to teach Quran and he received payment. Right, he received payment. Then later on, he saw some writings on the wall and he began to read it and people observed that he was, he was able to read. So they came to him again, he said, you know how to read? And he said, yes, I know how to read and write. So once again, they came and they offered him payment to teach him how to read and write. And they saw, and they continued to live with him, and they saw how righteous of a man he was, how scholarly he was, until they came with an offer. They said, look, there is a orphan girl, and this girl is righteous, pious. We want you to marry her. So he said, he refused at first. He said, I'm not going you know, to marry her. And they kept on insisting and insisting, and then finally he agreed. And so the day came for the wedding, and he was met face to face with his bride. And something amazing, he saw something amazing. As he was presented in with her in front of him, he saw the same necklace, right? He saw the same necklace that he had found years before, much uh, earlier. And it was hanging on the chest of his bride-to-be. And so he became fascinated with it, and he was just staring at it. And the people were confused. And they started to say to him, what are you doing? Why, you know, you're supposed to be looking, you should be looking at your wife. You know, you're breaking your heart by looking at the necklace. Why are you concentrating on the necklace? And so he told them the story. He told them the story of how he found this necklace and how he returned it to the rightful owner and what happened. And after he told the story, everyone started to uh, proclaim the takbir. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Everyone was excited and happy. And he was confused. He didn't know why they were getting so excited for. And he asked them, what, you know, what's going on? Why are you guys so excited? And then they told him, they said to him that the, this necklace who belongs to this girl, her father is the same man that you met years ago. Right? His father is the same man that you met years ago. And this father, he used to make a dua. He used to say, Allahumma jma' bayni wa baynahu hatta uzawijahu bibnati. He used to make a dua, oh Allah, gather me and him together so I could marry my daughter to him. And subhanAllah, the dua came true. Years later, and this man, he had passed away by then. And so, uh, the scholar, he married the, one, he, he married the girl. And then later on, she, uh, Allah Azza caused her to die. And then he inherited the necklace. The same necklace that he could have taken much earlier upon sin. He took it and he and it became rightful in his possession. So this is the hadith. مَنْ تَرَكَ لِلَّهِ شَيْئًا مَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَوَّدَهُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْهُ Whoever leaves all something for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with that which is better. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to leave off those things that distract us from the path of Allah. And we ask Him to make us firm in our religion. And we ask Him to accept our deeds.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله على آله وأصحابه أجمعين قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من ترك لله شيئا عوده الله خيرا منه whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah Allah will replace it with that which is better so we mentioned examples of how this hadith can come true in this dunya we also mentioned that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it but will replace it in the hereafter and there are many examples of this of things that we are as Muslims we are not allowed to partake in and if we leave it off and we leave it off for the sake of Allah and we expect that Allah subhanahu wa will replace it with what is better for example we are not allowed to drink alcohol alcohol has been made for, uh, forbidden on us but in the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace us leaving this alcohol for his sake with what is better there will be wine and alcohol in paradise in fact there will be rivers there will be a river of wine river of alcohol that Allah subhanahu wa will give us but it will be much better it will be much better in quality Allah Azza says that they will exchange uh, they will exchange glasses or cups of, of alcohol wine and in this wine and alcohol there will be no sin there will be no vain talk and ill speech and there will be no sin so the wine of the alcohol will be much better in quality another example we leave off for example the use of gold and silver utensils the Prophet says that we are not allowed Muslims are not allowed to use gold and silver utensils the actual material and he says فَإِنَّهَا لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ that these things they are for the disbelievers in this life but you will have it in their hereafter you will, you will have it at your disposal in the hereafter also the Prophet says with regard to leaving off argumentation leaving off argumentation the Prophet says أَنَا زَعِيمُ بَيْتٍ فِي رَبَدُ الْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَاءَ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُحِقًا that the Prophet says I guarantee a house in paradise in the outskirts of paradise for the one who gives up arguing even if he's right you give up this argumentation even if you're right you give it up for the sake of Allah Azza and expect that Allah will give you a reward with a house in paradise and the Prophet says in this hadith وَبَيْتٍ وَبَيْتٍ فِي وَسْطِ الْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْكَذِبِ uh, and the Prophet says, I guarantee a, a house in the middle of paradise for the one who gives up lying even when he is joking. One who gives up lying even when he is joking. And of course, we as Muslims, final thing to say is coming back to the issue of fasting. What are we doing when we're fasting? We're giving up our food and we're giving up our drink and we are giving up. Our desires, as Allah Azza says, يَتْرُكُ طَعَمَهُ وَشَرَابُهُ وَشَهْوَتَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِي That Allah says He gives up, the fasting person gives up his food and He gives up his drink and He gives up his desires for my sake. Maybe we'll see the reward in this life. right? Maybe we'll see the reward in this life. You give up your food, you give up your drink, and then maybe you come to Masjid al-Siddiq and you, you receive a, a, a meal that's much better than you would have got at home, maybe. Or you don't see the reward in this life, but you'll see it in the hereafter. Where Allah subhanahu wa will provide with food and will provide drink, the likes of which cannot be described in this life. And it will be said to them, Kulu washrabu hani and bima kuntum ta'amalun. It will be said to those who fasted, as Ibn Abbas says in Tafsir this verse, Kulu washrabu hani and bima kuntum ta'amalun. It will be said to those who fasted, eat and drink with pleasure because of what you used to do. So this is a reminder that when we're fasting, keep this hadith. Uh, a reminder, as a reminder, keep this hadith keep this hadith in your head that we are giving up when we're fasting, what are we doing? we're giving up our food, we're giving our drink we're giving up all these things for the sake of Allah Azza wa and we expect and we know and we believe that the promise of Allah Azza wa is true that Allah will replace these things if not in this life then in the next life with what is better <laughs> ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما 
عباد الله ان الله يامركم بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذاكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله اكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون اقيموا الصلاه. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر